The sea indirectly facilitated my transition from boy to man. More accurately, it stopped me from becoming the grown-up I probably would have been. But strictly speaking, my fate was decided not so much by the oceans themselves, but by another man from the port of Leith, who'd allowed the tides to define him. Like him, I was born very close to the water, but unlike him, I very rarely saw it. From our vantage, first from the Leith tenement, then Muir House flat, the sea was visible only as the oily, dark Firth of Forth, a river long gone tidal since its weaving adolescence in the truss ice, as it bled slowly into the frozen North Sea. The port and associated North Edinburgh schemes could occasionally be difficult terrain for a fledgling, self-described, they all are, intellectual, that horrendous archetype who wrote terrible poetry and wanted to seduce the kind of beautiful girl you saw on the television, rather than strictly the ones next door. This is largely because you didn't like the way she always wanted to hang out with her mum and big sister, and looked at her latter's children, and then you with challenging intent. The girls on TV and in the movies, or the ones you saw at the town in the festival, lived in different worlds, seemingly free from such oppressive ties. Those were the worlds I wanted access to. Meanwhile, the scheme ploughed on with its beautiful, raucous dramas that invigorated and frustrated in equal measure. Role models for masculinity were abundant and fascinating, but generally limited. That was my own fault. I always asked for and expected a hell of a lot more from life than most. Of course, I wasn't just an arty ponce. I loved football and boxing and music. I was only average at the mall, which is worse than being bad. You simply stick around longer for more humiliation. And I could curse and drink with the best of my fellow spotty apprentices. I possessed a sharp and caustic tongue which I sensed better fighters were often wary of. I tried on all the clothes, hard man, fanny merchant, joker, intellectual, political, sharp dresser, drug addled waster, but none fitted correctly. And none would until I added the other special ingredient that made me more comfortable in my own skin. I had always craved the endless possibilities of travel. I wanted romance with somebody whose brother I didn't know. Someone who never babysat for her younger siblings or her sister's kids. I wanted to access lives I only had a vague idea ever existed. I was far from unhappy in my own life. In fact, I loved it. I just wanted variety. I was curious. It was one particular man of the sea who helped provide that pass. Let's call him JL. He was a stick-thin Samuel Beckett clone, a mate of my dad and uncle. A bunch of those old boys, as we called those men in their 40s then, all from the docks, shipyards and maritime fleet, drank in the marksman bar in Duke Street. The old industrial working classes may have been on their way out, but back then they still ruled supreme. Unlike the dockers who talked of thieving, and the tooled up shipyard workers at Rob Callard who talked violence. JL spun tales of the merchant seaman's life, spiced with the intoxicating promise of sex and travel. It struck me fondly back then that the young men need an uncle figure to tell them about carnal affairs. Your own dads are too embarrassed. Find a nice lassie, treat her right, and dunny bring shame in this house are admirable sentiments to live by but also a little limiting. A roadmap to the good life they do not constitute on their own. Not for a Ponzi arty type. JL had a different approach. His life was the sea, as it offered him freedom from not just confinement, but from attachment. He would move close in and advise us in his grouse whiskey breath, one eye shut, the other outrageously open. Get up the town and fire into the posh festival birds. Did he waste your time with some wee hangout for the spiral? He'll never leave the scheme that way. I sensed that JL was particularly directing those sentiments towards me. 
In my complete engagement, he read a fellow wandering soul. But like him, I didn't so much want to leave the scheme as to take it with me all around the world. Out of the 30 or so of us who went to see our dads and the old boys for a pint before going our way in a pub crawl, which culminated in a spiral or even some disco up the tune, only two of us, myself and three or four others, including the best looking guy in the mob, ventured as far as the Royal Mile and the pop-up festival clubs. The other lads, and they will probably kick fuck out of me for saying this, I think were a wee bit intimidated. It was out of their comfort zone. JL, however, was on hand to provide advice for every possible outcome of our romantic adventures. I recall one particular contention that was highly idiosyncratic and not empirically correct, but like all raconteurs, he knew that loose words spoken with conviction have a dynamism charged that supersedes their content. The posh birds, you have to love them like they're cabin boys, he informed us. Portuguese cabin boys are the best. When some of the other old guys heard this, they would nervously bark. Danny, listen to him. He's talking nonsense. He's winding you up. But I detected the strong waft of truth in his pithy disclosures. We would later learn that JL had two families, one back in Granton and the other in Montevideo, or Monte as he called the Uruguayan capital in his unmistakable gravelly tones. And yes, it transpired that there was also a lover who was Portuguese, whom he'd worked with on several ships. This man came to Leith to find JL probably to confront him about his treachery, perhaps bribe him or elicit some sort of commitment. In the late 70s, homosexual acts in Scotland were still illegal. But strangely, or perhaps not so, ended up lodging for several years with JL's long-suffering wife, Yell. Of course, JL himself was gone. Probably got another boat, his mates and the marksmen would mumble, resolutely set in non-grass mode. But yes, it was inevitable that the old craggy coupon dog would be back at sea, or perhaps in Monte with his second family. Or maybe there was a third set of kin somewhere, and I can see his progeny in Shanghai or Marseille briefly looking up from the mischief they were indulging in, perhaps wistfully gazing out to the sea, wondering about its possibilities, and if they will ever allow it to make them. It certainly helped to make me, for better or worse, if only by the proxy of GL. I was on a train to London at 16, and then a plane to New York at 19. I've never stopped moving since, and it's all down to GL and those strange lessons he gleaned from the sea.